first to know when we release a new webisode. Sign up to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or to receive our email updates. See details at www.hivtalkshow.com. What I realize um, exists in the black gay community, but more so just the black community at large, is we don't really talk about sex. Like, I was raised, we, I didn't have conversations with, about sex with my parents, or I didn't even talk to my brothers about sex, not really. Not like in-depth conversations of what you do, what you don't do, and things like that. And I think that, you know, well, um, I used to live in New York, and while I was in New York, um, there was a, a campaign that was running called HIV Stops With Me. And as part of the campaign, they had, I think it was like eight spokesmodels. And they're basically just people that are HIV positive that you know want to share their story and share their message with the world at large. It started in New York, and I think it's probably started in California as well, but when I was chosen as a spokesmodel for the campaign, um, I knew that there were still family members that, that I had that did not know that I was positive. And you know, I, I, w I went through the, through the debate in my head because you know, I hadn't had that conversation. They might hear it because of the campaign, and I didn't want them to hear it that way. Um, but I just grappled with it in my head because, you know, again, I grew up, we didn't talk about sex. So how do I bring up this very uh, important and, and personal thing to my family and my friends? But, you know, at the end of the day, I realized that I didn't want them to turn the TV on or look at a, look at a billboard or, or someone call and say, I didn't know Corky was positive. You know, I didn't want them to find out that way. So I had to go to, you know, my my uh, my parents, my my immediate family, and, and say, you know, we never talked about this before. But you know, some of them didn't know that. You know, I, I like dealing with men. <laughs> so uh, we had that conversation, and I, we had a conversation about, you know, how I became positive in March of 2000, and you know, this this the whole story. And you know, I went to each one of them so that that they knew and also I want to make sure that I have that I have their support because this being a citywide citywide campaign and you know they have billboards and posters and you know I had stuff up on trains and you know uh, and uh, TV uh, coverage you know I didn't I didn't want to do something like that without having the support of my friends and my family that were closest to me and so that was another reason why I went to them and I was like you know this is what's going on with me. I need to know that I have your support uh, in going forward because if I did not, this, I don't think that I could have done a campaign of this magnitude. Uh, but, you know, thankfully, thankfully, uh, all of my family, they, they were behind me 100%. Um, they supported me, and, and to this day, they still do. And, you know, um, we still don't have a lot of conversations about sex, but I mean, it's, it's something that we talk about a little bit more, simply because I, you know, opened up to them and, and let them know, you know, this is me. So, Michael, when you were talking to your friends and, and your college room that night, how, 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 did you feel comfortable talking about it and sharing and? Yes, um, well, yes and no. I, I feel like that's a, you know, a very, dichotomy situation, right? I think that there are there are people and spaces that you feel comfortable talking about certain things with, and I think that there are, you know, people in those spaces that you don't feel comfortable talking about certain things with, right? And I think even in those safe spaces that there's a way that, you know, we all manage our own w health, you know, and wellness in those spaces. So I, I think it's probably idealistic to um, petition for complete candor, perhaps, but I do think that there's um, a necessity to, at the very least, like approach those conversations, those difficult and awkward conversations, in as tangible a way as possible, right? So maybe I don't have a conversation with, you know, my roommate about, you know, and, and I certainly could have handled that situation better. But maybe I don't. I have a conversation in a way that kind of meets him where he is, you know, kind of like what people were saying um, earlier. I remember that particular night, and since then, you know, our you know friendship has blossomed. You know, I have a, a great group of friends I can talk about, you know, virtually anything with. But I still say though that um, there's a lot of, for lack of a better word, stigma attached to um, a lot of topics of discussion. So even um, outside of the whole HIV or you know prevention conversation, we just talk about 
sex, you know, men having sex with men, and you know, the nature or the virtue of that action, right? There's a lot of stigma attached to that. So, you know, not only am I not going to tell you, you know, about the unsafe um, behaviors I'm participating in, because maybe I'm, you know, ashamed of receiving penetrative sex. Or maybe I'm ashamed of certain people um, that I've had sex with, or maybe I'm ashamed of um, certain experiences or, or sexual practices that I enjoy, right? And so that all, you know, that kind of um, that kind of bias, right, and oppression kind of lends its way into, you know, kind of wrapping the conversation around HIV and binding it in such a way that it's not accessible to people. A question not of how much sharing we do, but what we share. Mm -hmm. So for example, Quirky said that growing up he never talked about sex. Like my environment was hypersexual. We didn't, we, I mean, I, I can remember being in school at a very young age talking about sex, even though it was something I hadn't experienced. And now that I'm older, um, I still talk about sex a lot with my friends. What I don't, the, the conversations that I don't remember having when I was young and that I'm just starting to have now that I'm a little bit older are conversations around safe sex. Um, set how you protect yourself. So there's a lot about who you had sex with last night and how you think this guy is hot and what you want to do and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I don't hear much conversation around safe sex, how you're protecting yourself, how you could mm -hmm. protect yourself, um, and the responsibility that goes along with that. So I think that's what's missing, not the sharing itself, but what we're sharing. And do we have the information to share, to disseminate to our children, our families, our friends, et cetera. Well, and, well, I, and, um, and I'm going to offer that on the flip side, the conversation is just lacking that, that, that overall kind of connection to the child. A lot of times, in my experiences, besides just us talking to each other, because of course, you know, you're going to talk, you talk to your friends about sex in school and whatnot. And I learned about in sex. School, through, never. You never talked to your no. friends. Oh, I'm, I'm so 40. sorry. I, no, no, no. It, when I'm I was so in school, I was in school. I love, we were talking about that in first uh, grade. But no, 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 no. I'm no, saying no. like. But at 41, uh, yes. When, but with, in with, school, no. With hmm. our friends, and especially our parents, it's not that they don't talk about it. It's just that I've noticed that black, black parents tend to deal with it in, a, in the regards of if you're a girl, don't get pregnant, don't get knocked up. And, and their approaches may be different. And it has something to do with the so socioeconomic background. It may have something to do with continued education, whether they went to college or didn't, or they might be involved in certain programs which will make them more inclined. So I can't say that it's not talked about because I've been with mothers who talk to their daughters and their daughters would tell them, and, and their sons, that would tell them, yeah, we have this talk and she cool as hell. And because of that woman being that, that that fixture, that gatekeeper in that community, people will go to her and want to adopt her as to her mother because they can feel more comfortable talking to them because if they talk to their parents, it, 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 we, either the conversation won't be had or it's very much, well, you know what to do, just don't do it, you know? If you're gay, just use protection. That's their conversation. That's their, their one-liner. Oh, if you do decide to come out the closet, just be, you know, use protection because it's an awareness there, but I don't think they know how to approach it where, as a parent, because like I said, I don't have kids. How do you have this conversation with somebody that you know, you're know you looking after and you don't want anything to happen to them, but you don't want to sound like you're nagging, you don't want to turn them off to what you have to say, you want them to trust you, and then it's right around that time where you know they're going through their own changes. They're not being truly, some children aren't truly being as open about their experiences at school, whether it was good or, or, or bad, you feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it leaves that parent trying to figure out, well, if I do need to say anything, let me say it real quick. Look, just whatever you do, use protection. So I can't say that the conversation isn't had, it may not be had the way that we, we would like to envision it being had. Like, I, no, we're not gonna have a seminar from our parents. But what about no. the messages as gay men we give to each other? What about the conversations we have? Because I'm thinking about, and I don't know what, what y'all's experiences were, but when I first came out, the way I was sort of socialized into the gay community was, you know, you have to pick if you're going to be a top or a bottom. Mm -hmm. That's one message about sex. Mm -hmm. You have to pick, you know, then you, you, you know, the stuff around anal health you don't really hear a lot about. Like, so if you decide to get penetrated, you don't really, m m many of us that get penetrated, we get penetrated before knowing exactly how to do it or what to do it. So we have these very traumatic 
their views and to you know <clears throat> sexual experiences with each other, which also might misshape and misinform how we sort of develop later on. I'm thinking about the misinformation we might get around HIV. I, mean, I think there's just, I guess what I'm committed to, I'm really not interested in what, I'm less interested in what straight people or the mainstream culture tell us about sex, even our families, and I'm more interested in us as gay men creating spaces, especially for younger gay men that come into community or newer gay men, that, well not newer, but you know, new into community, that we, that they're able to access messages and information that's gonna be better for them.